There we go. Now we got to get your introduction, Beth, on tape. All right. Okay. All right. Well, uh, thanks everybody for joining. Um, this is the kickoff session for the ProSocial Worlds Research Seminar Series. And uh, I've, I've met a couple of you, but not all. I'm, uh, my name is Beth Hawkins, and I'm the Director of Research here at ProSocial World. I've been with ProSocial uh, for only about six months. Um, and I'm really quite excited to kick off this seminar series and, and uh, learn much more from Sage. So um, this is a part one of a two part series. And uh, so Sage Gibbons, our own ProSocial World um, staff, he'll be presenting today. And then next week, uh, David Sloan Wilson will be presenting the second, uh, the second part next week at noon um, Eastern time. So with that said, thanks again. I'll hand over to, to David to provide yeah, some comments. Just, uh, just to reiterate that this is now the inauguration of our second weekly seminar series. Our main seminar series host of, of speakers. And uh, the expectation is that the audience is gonna be quite general. And so the talks are, are accessible. Uh, the research seminar series does focus on research and so it's, it's going to get pretty geeky, folks, uh, but that's not to scare any of you off. And I think that um, we're all on a learning curve of one sort or another. And so uh, I think that the research seminar series is going to be, by definition, at a more uh, advanced level, but um, um, still, I think, accessible and super interesting and so on and so forth. So, so everyone's welcome to the to the research seminar series, which will feature not only our own people, but also just the best and the brightest of researchers on, on um, cultural evolution, uh, the world around. And so, uh, and I think that this is a step towards becoming a hub for this kind of research, an international hub, um, in the same way that the Santa Fe Institute is the international hub for complex system science. Uh, we're on our way for evolutionary science. And so that I'll pass to Sage, and um, and uh, look forward to uh, to um, uh, listening and joining the Q and A, and then I'll take my turn next week. Great. All right, let me pull up this and gather myself. Wait a minute. Well, I don't know any way to do this besides slideshow. That's a good way. So I'll just put that together. Sorry, one moment. All right. Okay. So today is I missed it in the titles, but it's part one of a two-part set of presentations um, with myself and David. And we will be focusing on the symbotype concept um, as understood through a dual inheritance theory lens. So this presentation will focus on sort of setting the groundwork of uh, dual inheritance theory and an introduction of the symbotype concept uh, as I come to understand it um, and the added value it might have, um, particularly towards uh, applied cultural evolution in small local contexts. So we're thinking about microevolution in that case, which is really the optimal intersection of cultural evolution and contextual behavioral science and many of the other fields that influences pro-social world's scientific and research framework. So with that, I'll kick it off. So I am a research scientist and strategic technology manager for pro-social world. I'm interested in cultural evolution, complex adaptive systems, participatory action research, and of course, facilitated processes of behavioral change. I'm also dedicated to the development of open, interoperable, and pro-social technology. I've recently completed a master's of science in urban informatics at Northeastern University, working with the Boston Area Research Initiative, 
where I studied the city of Boston as a complex adaptive system, focusing on neighborhoods as a primary unit of study. So we're just going to have two parts here. First, I'll present dual inheritance theory and the central role of cultural inheritance in human behavior and evolution. And then I will introduce this symbotype concept and its relationship to phenotype and genotype. So dual inheritance theory. We humans have three sources of adaptive information all of which bear upon our phenotype. If we go back to basics, our phenotype can uh, encapsulate all expressed aspects of ourselves, um, but particularly as understood through genetic expression. But it, it, it encapsulates our biology, our behavior, and the cognitive structure of our, our psychology. We also have our genotype, sorry, the first source of adaptive information is our genotype, which bears upon our phenotype. Through genetic expression, we get the aforementioned phenotype. But we also have, as well as many, many, many other organisms, the process, the possibility of individual learning, selection by consequences within a lifetime, our experience in our environment. These are the source of individual learning is, is in contextual behavioral science terms, uh, behavioral contingencies. This is a near universal process of encoding interactions between the environment and the phenotype at the individual level. It's possible, it's out there that this the, the capacity for individual learning is responsible for the Cambrian explosion of life. In animals and humans, such encoding of experience can occur via psychological reinforcement. And in humans, such reinforcement also incorporates symbolic behavior. I'll get more on that later. Like the rest of the biological world, uh, for the most part, <laughs> in at least the animal kingdom, uh, human phenotypes come from both our genetic heritance and individual learning. But we also have a third source of information which is culture. Culture provides to us the cumulative cultural adaptations of generations before. These, are, these cumulative cultural adaptations are such that no one person or even a population of people could reinvent them within a single lifetime or generation. Think algebra, masonry, written language. A good thought experiment to understand uh, and emphasize the uh, importance of culture in, in difference from individual learning or even social learning within a lifetime is the cumulative aspect of it. Um, a human dropped on a desert island at, say, seven years old, assuming they were able to survive, the ways in which they would learn to survive would be they would not replicate the tools, they would not replicate the ideas and practices that we know. Much of our phenotype, much of our behavior, our psychology, what we do is the direct inheritance of our culture, of this cumulative inheritance. A key aspect of the cumulative, of cumulative culture though, requires long-term stability of evolved cultural traits. And this is the unique human capacity, the capacity to come up with solutions and then maintain them over generations. So dual inheritance theory is all about the combination of genetic information and cultural information. These two inheritances are a uniquely human phenomenon. I'm adding these little self arrows here to, of course, stress the fact that our phenotype is itself um, constantly learning and adapting. So think about epigenetics, think about the way your biology changes over time. Um, it's not as if our phenotype is just fixed from a biological standpoint by our genes, but rather is most of the adaptive information is coming from within the gen within a lifetime. 
And relatedly, individual learning is doing this as well. I mean, it's basically in the word learning to constantly be updating. So with all of this on in view, we can think of two different major interactions here. We can think of the way that over the long run, across many, many generations, culture can, as a part of the environment, it exerts a selection pressure on our genetic evolution. So because part of our environment is cultural, the genes that are being selected for are those with which are best adapted to uh, inherit that culture. This in turn changes our phenotypic expression and our phenotype itself, which exerts subsequent selection pressure on cultural evolution. So this together, is gene culture co-evolution and is responsible for some of the most foundational aspects of who we are as a species. We also have in smaller timescales, although it can extend across generations as well, but within generations as well, we can have phenotype culture co-evolution. So basically within a single lifetime, one is inheriting all kinds of culture, and this is affecting our very phenotype, our very bi biology. It's not affecting our genes. Our genes are fixed, but it is affecting our phenotype. So just to emphasize these two processes, the gene culture co-evolution and phenotype culture co-evolution, they're splitting these is helpful because it helps understand, it helps one understand the, the differences in the time scale, what it means to have culture affect genes versus what it means to have culture affect our phenotype. So consider the fact that our gut is too short and our jaw is too weak to properly digest raw food. Our digestive system is adapted to an environment which expects the presence of fire. And I'm totally stealing that from Michael Mutha Krishna, but it's so good that I have no reason to think of a better version. <laughs> and from Michael's colleague, Joe Henrik, I'll steal another, which is a, a the in the phenotype culture co-evolution. So now we're thinking within a human lifetime, especially through development, the act of writing changes the biology of the brain, or rather the acquisition of literacy changes the biology of the brain. So... We're just going to gloss over the uh, technical details because uh, I'm not a neuroscientist, but to take Joe Henrik's word for it, we all today, here today, presuming you're being, you're able to read what's on the screen, have what's called a letterbox centered in the left ventripetal <laughs> occipital temporal region of your brain. Brain imaging it shows that the letterbox registers culturally evolved resemblance between Ah, I should have put this on in on the slides, but I'll type it just to emphasize the point. We recognize the difference between those two words, capital read and lowercase read, even though physically they're actually nothing alike. Learning to read changes our brain's biology. It specializes the brain for visually processing one's writing system. The rewiring that occurs gives us longer verbal memories, broader patterns of activation across the brain to the spoken word, and greater awareness of the various sounds that make up words. And note that all of those traits are not directly related to literacy, but are changes in the, are the way that our brain actually works. But it doesn't come without costs, and the costs that it probably comes with are undoubtedly understudied, but at least one aspect of literacy is the that we become worse at identifying faces um, as we become far better at identifying symbols. And the known right side asymmetry of recognizing faces may be due to simply the position of the letterbox in the brain. So I emphasize this to, to give the point that at massively long time scales over our evolution and within a lifetime. Culture is affecting everything about us. And perhaps uh, my favorite example, just to really drive it in, 
um, although the, I don't have the time to get into the comparison, is this illusion. So you may see an illusion here where A and B are different lengths, where B is, seems longer than A. In fact, they are the same length. And this is the this is a, an old illusion that up until 2010, anyone would have told you that is a universal illusion that people experience. But in 2010, Joe Henrik published a paper called The Weirdest People in the World, weird standing for Western, educated, industrial, rich, and democratic. This is the population of which almost all psychological research has been studied upon. Um, even worse, uh, usually undergraduate students in college. Um, this kind of illusion is not nearly as strong in other peoples, especially when given to those who um, spend much more time outside. <laughs> so in fact, this the entire presence of this illusion is not at all some sort of cognitive uh, gadget that we've discovered, but it may just simply be another cultural byproduct of our highly built symmetrical environment. So if that doesn't kind of <laughs> drive it home that our culture affects the way you even see things, then I don't know what will. And I wanna emphasize a couple of key points, just pulling this back up again on what dual inheritance theory um, brings to the table in terms of the history of thought of evolutionary thinking. So, and I'm quoting from a few different papers here, that behavioral geneticists, gen genetics and cultural evolution have both revolution revolutionized our understanding of human behavior, but have done so largely independent of each other. Cultural dynamics are typically missing from models of gene to phenotype causality. We've gone from the psychological foundations of culture by Tubi and Cosmides and Cosmides in 1992 to a paper that was published in 2023, historical psychology and understanding that aspects of our psychology have evolved culturally over time. And when we really think about phenotype cultural evolution, we can appreciate that how much of our recent psychology has been shaped by the advent of writing, numeracy, different types of agriculture, the industrial revolution, the internet, smartphones. And to emphasize how new this line of thinking really is, um, that paper, Weirdest People in the World, which basically um, cast all of psychological research as not universal, but on a subset of cultural people who occupy a certain space of an end space cultural uh, possibility was only published in 2010. So why is human culture cumulative? Well, there are two related aspects that seem central. The first is the high fidelity of, fidelity of our cultural transmission. By fidelity, we mean the uh, accuracy of information that is transmitted from one to another and our propensity for symbolic thought. Symbolic thought, we can define broadly as our capacity to make, to have our infinite capacity to make arbitrary associations between a sign, a word, uh, uh, a gesture, and reference. Um, we can do, we can have a symbolic uh, sign that has no correlation in time and space, to the thing we are referencing. It doesn't even represent it at all. What this means is that we can transmit not just our sort of public productions of a culture, like the, the end trait, but also our mental representations as well. And as tasks and traits become increasingly complicated, this allows for um, and reinforces high fidelity cultural transmission. And, and of course, in addition, it has opened up the possibility for basically purely abstract culture, norms, institutions, these kinds of things. So some other animals have versions of culture, but it is not cumulative. One example that I've liked recently is 
orcas and killer whales. They're the same biological species, but they occupy uh, different ecological niches. Uh, they're separate populations, you know, generally Atlantic Pacific. Um, as compared to orcas, killer whales have developed entirely different strategies for hunting sharks, seals, and other whales. And they have whistles and squeaks that reference these prey and different behaviors to actually hunt them. However, despite the use of signs, whistles, let's say, those are either indexical, so correlated in space and time, they're referencing something that's near or soon, or they're iconic, directly emulating the sound, uh, and it's a direct reference. They're not symbolic. So taking the symbolic thought angle of what makes culture cumulative, from an orca or killer whale perspective, um, the lack of symbolic capacity limits the potential to which um, what they've learned can be transmitted and accumulated over generations. So a killer whale can give a, a whistle as they do, signaling that seals are ahead and that they should be stealthy and quiet. And other whales would understand this immediately to be referential. It's, a, it's referencing something that's happening in space and time. But as far as we know, one whale cannot whistle to another and reference seals in general, like, you know, seals, <laughs> without the other thinking that seals are nearby. To focus on the fidelity of cultural transmission in a simulation paper, Lewis and Leland in 2012 found that fidelity of cultural transmission, the accuracy with which we can transmit the information, it leads to exponential growth and trait longevity. And this translates into reduced trait loss over time. And they um, assert that animals rely on low fidelity copying mechanisms. So they're locally enhancing um, what's around them. Um, roughly, they're not, they're not uh, transmitting um, the full range of uh, internal and external possible information that could be there. Whereas humans also use high fidelity processes that are all dependent on symbolic thought. So teaching, verbal instruction, accurate imitation. Accurate imitation is non-trivial either. The, the actual, we have a, a real propendency um, to copy a sequence of steps wholesale. So if there's 10 steps to assemble some tool um, and two of them seem superfluous, We'll just copy them anyway. At least we'll have a bias to do so. Whereas if you give that same challenge to a chimpanzee, they'll remove those steps. They'll optimize because they're unnecessary. But the way in which cumulative cultural adaptations work are often opaque. Again, you cannot conceive of algebra from the start. It's it's None of us really uh, can possibly comprehend the ways in which the different steps of a process, for example, are connected. And so changing things based on your own local personal intuition is more likely to be harmful than not. And a great example of this from The Secret of Our Success uh, by Joe Henrik is um, the various practices uh, that groups use in the Americas before 1500 to chemically release niacin, vi vitamin B3 from corn and maize, um, which a deficiency of niacin um, can create the disease pellagra. So some groups burn seashells or used ash from certain kinds of wood or found natural sources of lye. And these function as an alkali, which can remove the niacin. So this is complex chemistry, how they stumbled upon <laughs> The, the exact way to do this is, is uh, kind of a bit of real life magic. But you can imagine that changing the procedure there without any understanding of the underlying chemistry at all would, would have devastating consequences. So as a result, we have part of, part of our psychological toolkit that we've evolved from gene cultural coevolution co is high fidelity imitation, even when we might have an intuition that we think could be made different, uh, more efficient. Okay, so that's the background broadly. 
of dual inheritance theory. And now I'd like to introduce the symbotype concept, which I do think can help um, when it comes to microevolutionary processes. So specific groups, unique individuals, um, much of what I've discussed has been at the macroevolutionary lens. I mean, these are universal processes and biases and, and dynamics, but they, they can explain why certain things are happening in a broad brush way. But if you ask uh, a population of people, uh, study a population of people using these, um, you won't really understand what they're about. And you certainly won't be able to in your own life um, really make a difference with this understanding. And I think the symbotype concept is in one part philosophical and in one part very real and perhaps uh, essential for connecting um, this macroevolutionary theory to microevolutionary thought. Before I get into it, I need to lay one piece of um, foundation here which is that despite all of that wholesale copying that we may do, and despite the fact that your, your trait and my trait in the end look quite alike, we're not actually replicating each other. Cultural transmission is fundamentally reconstructive. And I'll show you this visually. So here's a process of a cultural chain. So we have actor one and actor two. Actor one, perform some public production, something that others can see. They're communicating out of the mind and into the world. Speech, writing, a gesture, perhaps it's a piece of art. Whatever it is, it's something that's public. Actor two observes this, takes it in, and then represents what that means privately in their own mind. They, in turn, can reproduce publicly what has occurred and may even match it exactly. And then this in turn can produce a private representation by the original actor or somebody else or many others on what that means and what they were thinking and so on and so forth. And in this way, we see cultural transmission occurring as at least between two or more people. And it's this interaction of what can be seen publicly, what's produced, and then how that is then acquired, stored, and then reactivated um, from the mind and then back out. But this piece right here <laughs> is the rub. And this is why it's reconstructive. The gap between the private representation of actor one and how they publicly produce this, and then how it's understood by actor two, it's, it's, there's, there's a mismatch, right? So as the fidelity is, can only go so far, there's, not, there's no way for me or anybody to possibly know truly what is in the minds of another. And certain kinds of public productions, for example, speech, what I'm saying right now, that we could call that a near 100% fidelity. What I'm saying is almost exactly what I mean in my mind. Although I'm looking at notes, so there's more that I know than you know. So there's context. But then you can think of something like a piece of pottery. Well, what does that mean? And what is the representation in actor two and how much does that relate to what actor one meant? And so despite the fact that the form may stay the same, the process by which it's produced could be entirely novel. We could be thinking of things completely differently. And this is pretty analogous to the way that different genotypes can converge in the same phenotype. The difference is that in genotypes, you could actually replicate the genotype, but in culture, you can't. Great. So and the word we can call this this process is inference. And what occurs when we learn something from another is we can call inferential transformation, the way in which the input of the world is actually understood by our psychology. And especially our the structure of our cognition and the way in which um we simplify and discretize things to make it more understandable, more memorable. We connect it to other things that will help us remember it or apply it later. The meaning of which also, of course, can change many times. We could think about something 
privately many, many times and produce something the same way or differently. Um, but there's always this, this gap and we have to infer what the other means. So with that said, with this process of cultural transmission understood as fundamentally reconstructive, we can get into the Simba type. So to simplify my earlier uh, diagram, just removing phenotype for now, um, culture is is transmitted and and is and is connected to individual learning. So individuals are learners and they're finding models or whether they're people or artifacts and using those to transmit the culture information to themselves. So part of this learning is the symbolic meaning of the cultural information. So this, you know, our learned associations between what we do and what our actions mean are a fundamental part of human psychology. Simply just copying the do is not enough. Um, because of our capacity for symbolic thought, instead of only learning by consequences through what we directly experience, we can first imagine what consequences of a behavior might be and adjust accordingly. We can express entirely novel behavioral regimes if our context and our symbolic framing supports it. And furthermore, these imagined consequences can actually affect our psychology in ways that are just as powerful as externally driven consequences. So when we engage in symbolic behavior, whether it's privately or publicly, we're actually engaging in psychological reinforcement, the consequences of which will affect not only the behavior that others can see, but the very way we think. And that last phrase, the way we think, I think is at the heart of what the symbotype means. So although our capacity for symbolic thought is infinite in its combinatorial power, we can associate anything with anything and anything could be meshed in a whole relational network, the actual set of symbolic behavior that we, any one of us does engage in, does express, is limited. So, and of that set, what we ever express at any one point in time is a subset. So via symbolic behavior, we are continually reproducing and are, we are continually producing and reinforcing and changing what we can call our symbotype. So this set of potential symbolic behavior, this it, it's produced by all past symbolic behavior. So from our symbotype, all future symbolic behavior derives and is created. And to the extent that we believe that symbolic associations are stored in the mind in the psychological reinforcements of our neurology, the symbotype is very real. Because the symbotype doesn't exist in the same way a genotype does, right? It is It only can exist at the very earliest from one's first symbolic thought or symbolic behavior. So it must only be able to be understood over time. It's, it's produced and generated over time. It's not fixed, but we can still measure it. And then I think it's interesting to think that if we were to measure every thought, speech, piece of writing, gesture, every symbolic behavior you've done up till right now, we could call that set of inform information your current symbotype right now. From it, we can consider the context and one's history of individual learning to predict and understand your future express symbolic behavior. And if we, if we drop the symbotype concept, and if we just think culture has symbolic meaning, and we learn this, and that governs how we think, we lose track of the fact that the culture that I get, I have to inferentially transform, I have to interpret. And all of us are doing this all the time. That's how we decide even who to choose, learn from in the first place. And then our psychological experiences, our, our thoughts and feelings and the consequences they have are changing the very way that we'll think again. And so we get this set of symbolic information that is different from one person to the next, despite the fact that they may share many things in common. They may be, share cultural transmission that is identical 
but they will still have different symbotypes, different set of symbolic behavior from which they can draw from. Of course, in practice, if we were to study one symbotype, we would do this generally unless one is uh, deceased with a far more narrow time frame and sensitivity context. And I think there's a lot to learn from contextual behavioral science here. And I, uh, the, the concept of relational frames from contextual behavioral science um, is basically what set of symbolic associations am I applying in this context right now? And what and how is that governing my behavior, my very thought? Um, and considering that and how it structures our the psychological function of our behavior and, and our context is, is critical to understanding why individuals do what they do. It's not enough that they just learn, but they we, given our symbolic capacity, can consider things as we do them. <clears throat> and so to draw a bridge between this concept, I don't think there's a meaningful difference between the total set of relational frames that one could have over one's life and to what I'm calling a symbotype. So to tie it all together, and the way in which the symbotype as a set of uh, our total set of symbolic information expressed over our lifetimes affects and, and relates to this reconstructive process and this gap of inference. So we can consider that each actor has the symbotype at time zero right now. And in this process of public production and private representation, actor two draws upon their symbotype and this is what structures their private representation. And we should be able to study this. And likewise, what they end up producing publicly is drawn upon from this. And this is ignoring behavioral contingencies and context. It's just to basically say that if you want to explain how people think and what things mean, well, the best place to look is to what they thought before and what they meant before. And then likewise, as this process continues, there's this indirect interaction of symbotypes. And then if you think of every individual in a pop population engaging in this process, the set of information that they contribute to the cultural pool is being modulated by their own symbotype, their own psychology. And so if we just study culture as the lump sum, we will be missing a vast amount of symbolic information, a vast amount of, of the explanation for why people are doing what they're doing, how they are thinking about it, and how those two things interact. And so the total set of symbolic information covered by and all of the different symbotypes of the actors is necessarily greater than that which is in culture. And then the interaction of the two is really, is really where one can almost gloss it over, especially in longer time frames, especially when there are really strong ecological selection pressures. So sometimes all that matters is the public production. It doesn't really matter how you think of it. I mean, it, it, it might be, it might be relevant. It might not be. But I mean, if this is the right size sphere or this is the right format for a document, <laughs> it doesn't really matter why that is or why you think it is. Um, the selection pressure is on Im Im imitating it. But for so much else that is governed symbolically and so much else that explains an individual's behavior, why they are doing the things they're doing in the moment that they are in, we cannot just look to culture as the answer because that will not explain any individual in any moment in time. It will not explain microevolution. We have to understand behavior in context. And we have to understand that through the lens of symbolic thought. But I offer this graphic as um, an illustration of Without the symbotype is the more canonical view. And with it, we, we have a better understanding of this process of inferential transmission as governed by a constantly updating set of symbolic information. And we can take seriously that set as um, it's, it's a subset of the symbolic information in the culture, but without it, um, we're, we're a bit blind. So just to emphasize some of the key points here, symbotypes change over time, whereas genotypes are fixed at birth. Likewise, culture changes over time. 
Whereas genetic information is replicated with minimal error and recombination, but it's, it's, it's the actual information in your genes is replicated nearly one-to-one. -one. Symbolic information transmitted between people has to be reconstructed. We cannot understand what is in the mind of the other in full. And so I'll end with this phrase, the phenomenology of cultural transmission lies in the communication between two or more people. But the phenomenology of cultural expression lies within each of our minds. And if we measuring symbotypes will allow us to better understand the role of individual minds in modulating their cultural and genetic inheritance. We are not purely copying agents we inter interpret. And universal processes of cognition will not explain our individual uh, interpretations. There are many, many, many cultural transmission biases that explain, inferential transmission can be explained in totally universal terms. The reduction of entropy, the uh, what's easier to remember, what's more emotionally valent, what's more relevant to us personally. Um, who were who? How successful the person is coming through, but these don't explain uh, individuals or local context. They explain general patterns, and we can certainly interpret and we'll find those patterns. But if we don't actually engage in the way that people think in their minds, and how that is informed by the way they've ever thought before, then we will always be finding the same general patterns and helpless to explain why anybody is doing anything they're doing right now. That's it, some literature. Wow, that was amazing. That was amazing, Sage. Okay, so we're back. And so uh, so uh, let's have, so yes, first of all, let's have a round of applause. Mm -hmm. And then, and now we have questions, and we have a good long time, as long as we want, basically, to ask questions. And I am uh, continue my custom of never being the first to ask questions to being the fourth or fifth. And uh, it doesn't surprise me that Liano is the first, followed by Brian. Why am I not surprised? <laughs> OK, um, yeah, all right. Um, so a couple of things. Great, great, uh, great presentation on the, uh, on the literature and the, the details there. A couple of things. I wanted to point out one one quick thing. Um, when you're talking about the um, the two symbol types interacting, um, uh, I, I think I think a key a, a key piece that you missed in that in that section is that it's that it's, it's that it is rarely just two. Uh, it's multiple. Uh, it's it, it, you 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 learn from multiple informants. And those multiple perspectives, those multiple versions, uh, help to narrow down the possible range of of, of interpretations. Um, uh, so, for example, this is demonstrated in uh, I, I can't remember if it was I think it's in the in the in uh, Henrik's uh, Secret of Our Success book where he talks about um, where he talks about learning being. If he did, he did a, an experiment where he did learning transmitted directly along the line, one person to one person to one person to one person, versus learning transmitted from a number of people to a number of people. And, uh, uh, and when, you, when, you, when you do those two different scenarios, uh, the, single, the single line transmission uh, is, does, does, not, does not accumulate a lot of new, new information very quickly, but the, uh, the, the many to many uh, does uh, significantly uh, uh, significantly improve that the 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 ability to transmit knowledge accurately. So I think that, I think that's a that, that, that's a that's a key part that that you missed there or that that you didn't uh, bring in there. I think that we need to think about. Um, uh, the other thing that I was going to say is, um, and I've been saying this a lot, uh, but I think that I think that our focus on the individual as the locus of evolution in this case, I think is misplaced because I think that what's, what's, what's actually happening is, is, is largely because of that many-to-many -many relationship, 
Um, we are, uh, we, we, we evolve, we, we have stories that evolve that are, that are highly conserved because of that, uh, that many-to-many -many, uh, learning relationship. And those stories uh, drive us to act and to behave in certain ways um, uh, that, um, uh, uh, that uh, produce their reproduction, that, that re reproduce them. And so the locus of evolution is actually in the stories, not in the individuals. Though the though though it's it's more it's more like the individuals are sort of like the genes or maybe gene clusters um, or something like that, and the stories are the thing that is actually evolving. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, I I think that that's a really important distinction to make, uh, especially in relation to the kinds of things we're talking about in in the immunology the the uh, uh, mental immunology um, um, discussions because I think it's I I. I I think it's really important. I have actually found it really useful in my own activities in the Democratic Party to stop thinking about people as having these ideas and start thinking about these stories as having people. Um, uh, because when you're trying to get somebody out, uh, uh, when you're trying to get somebody to think differently, what you're trying to do is you're trying to get them to, uh, to get a different story in their mind and hopefully eventually to start enacting that story actually. Um, and, uh, and, and, and so I, so I think, I think that's a really, that, that's, uh, uh, I think it'd be, I think it would be, uh, a much more powerful tool of analysis and, uh, investigation to think about it in that way, rather than as the individual being the, uh, uh, being, being the, the, the locus of evolution. Mm. Well, I could I have two things to say on that, which is one, you're absolutely right. The connectivity and size of a social network is key for both fidelity of transmission, but also just the convergence around solutions. Um, you know, in in Secret of Our Success, you the Henrik does a thought experiment of basically a bunch of isolated Einsteins and a bunch of uh, dunce social butterflies, and the social butterflies are thousandth of the intelligence of the Einsteins, but they're totally connected, and the Einsteins are all alone, and they uh, arrive at a solution, they blow them out of the water. So that's key. And my illustration is re restricted to two actors because it's uh, all that's needed to illustrate a cultural chain. But of course, what actually is happening is much more complex. And I think your point about public productions, so the actual cultural traits are being produced by individuals, but it's the traits that they share, the traits that, they, that are in the world that's what's being selected. And this is the same, and this is very important because this is no different than a fixation on the gene when what is actually being selected is the phenotype. So the expression of the gene is, is the vehicle or is the mechanism rather. So um, yes, we don't wanna focus on individuals, but I think it's basically uh, coming down to um, maintaining a level of granularity in the same way that we think about gene expression all the way through phenotype, through express psychology, behavior, and context, is not just thinking about culture as just happening across a group of people, but actually, who are those people and how are they interacting with this cultural set of information? And that if you go to any group of people and generalize them as just like an aggregate, you'll miss all of the explanation of why they're actually doing what they're doing. But yes, culture is a collective phenomenon, so we don't want to uh, lose sight of that. Okay, so uh, Ryan and then Paul. First, uh, my question, hopefully I'm going to be able to form a somewhat intelligent question, uh, but, but Sage, that presentation was just brilliant. Uh, kudos for you because you, you, what you, what you captured for me in your framing was tremendous, tremendous complexity and uh, I really applaud the, the way in which you, you did that. So um, I think my question is along the same lines as the discussion between yourself and Liano, but more specifically, what I don't know anything about is, I mean, I ha have a sense of 
how tech, technology and re, uh, the development of resources over time have helped uh, inform this discipline and study, uh, you know, of to kind of come to the complexity of uh, that you're, you know, that you're you're expressing or reflecting. Um, if, if we start with a hypothesis, like um, it's it's possible uh, for a collective culture in its unification to actually share a uh, purpose. Um, can you give me some idea how that might translate um, in affecting uh, geno genotype with um, respect to selection? Mm. Well, I mean, I think that's that's part of the value of the symbotype concept, be it we think of it as construct or the very real set of information in our mind, is that understanding um, the relational frames, to use another analogy, that are in people's mind is um, to understand the extent to which they do think alike. And um, although there is a gap between, you know, what we do in a, in a public way and how that is trans con contributing to culture and our broader evolution and how we think about it, I think it's uh, actually a fundamental and, and probably quite open question to the extent of which um, semantic symbolic alignment, um, you know, fidelity of the mind, not just of the product, is uh, important and plays a uh, plays a role. Um, so we focus on the content of what's transmitted and and you know how it changes from one person to the next and call that noise. But um, actually, what's happening there is is the application of our our symbolic mind. Um, and so I think that's a great question and one in which um, we should try to answer. <laughs> and more uh, just a little bit more specifically, kind of where I started, to to what extent is are, is con contemporary current research um, aiding? Or, or you know, facilitating, kind of helping that, that serving that 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 process. It just I I have no no yeah. idea. Well, I think that we have to um, likely look outside of the the field of cultural evolution as it stands, because in in an applied sense, it's probably pretty weak. Um, certainly, people are studying small groups of populations, but whether that's um, being uh, applied in a constructive or normative way, kind of like we think of it as pro-social is, I think, probably small overall. And that um, I, I'm drawing parallels to contextual behavioral science, one, because it's um, critical for that very kind of work, but because there's enough um, convergence there in the thinking that um, if you just change some of the terms and key processes, um, when you look to conjectural behavioral, behavioral science, you're more likely to find that kind of um, insight. I don't think the cultural evolutionists are um, thinking about outcomes in a normative sense. Okay, Paul. Hi, Sage. Hey, Paul. So I thank you for the talk. Um, I did miss parts of it, I must admit. Uh, but anyway, uh, so hopefully this question, this question is actually in response to the, your response then to Liano. You said, I think, the traits that are in the world, namely the products, the stories, are the units of selection of what's being selected. Did I understand that correctly? Uh, in a cultural sense. I mean, it, yeah. it needs to be in the world to contribute culturally. And that's the piece, well, that's a piece that I would take issue with. I, I see it as the behavior that's being selected and in a sense what you know it is the phenotype literally um so i don't i don't i think that the stories have us behaving in particular ways in responses to context different stories have us behaving in different ways or you can use those terminology but if you step away from the dualistic metaphor of a mind as a storage place 
and step into a, a purely naturalistic perspective of behavior unfolding in time. Surely it is behavior that is the 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 thing that's being selected. Mm. And in that sense, I mean, I appreciate Liano's call for um, trying to reach for a cultural level of selection. But I think we can only ever operationalize that through individuals changing their behavior, but also collectively through of what you're calling cultural transmission, mm -hmm. which for me would be, you know, processes of mimicry or uh, operant learning or whatever, um, but not transmission in the sense of a you know out of my mind into your mind mm -hmm. yeah well I think that's um profound and I also just wanted to clarify too that um the key word for me is just that it, the public element and I think that aligns with what you're saying uh, basically like what is behavior in the sense would be public um it's by public it just means that it can be seen by others um in okay. some shape or form otherwise how could transmission occur um yes and i yeah. also think that uh, it's something i didn't stress but it is um maybe close to kind of what you're angling for as well which is that the as much as we can talk about symbotype and and symbolic information is residing in the mind as some abstract informational set even if that is you know accurate <laughs> in some meaningful way um symbolic behavior symbolic expression, the production of that symbolic symbotype is always done in context and it's profoundly situated. And in fact, what something means has more to do with the context than it has to do with uh, anything else. And so it's, if, if anything, the same thought expressed in different contexts is what changes the meaning, not different thoughts in different contexts. So I think that's uh, that got kind of connects it to behavior and the situated nation, nature of behavior as well. Um, so that's why that's kind of why I um unresolved as the symbotype concept because it is so dualist and loses the fact of that situatedness. But I do think it's helpful um analytically, perhaps from a research perspective. Great. I'm looking forward to talking some more about this. And we do a research <laughs> seminar coming up. Great. <laughs> Thanks, Stage. Okay, all good stuff. So uh Cesar, Hank, and then it's my turn. Yeah, thank you very much. This was very interesting. I, I have a, a curiosity. Uh, where would knowledge be in this uh, diagram that you have? Because uh, knowledge is something that is very cultural. It's transmissible. It is reconstructed by by uh, each person. And it, I, I understood that it has a different granularity than the symbol types. But I would like to 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 hear from you, where do you put uh, knowledge in this, in the culture and in, in, in this diagram? Yeah, I mean, I think I think knowledge fits under the umbrella. Um, I think if we wanted to typologize it a little bit, maybe knowledge is that that which we know that uh, we have reason for knowing. So maybe we've experienced. Um, the consequences that have convinced us that what this is this is correct. This is something we know, we understand to be true. There's something about truth and knowledge, but I think um, these are different words for um, what I'm just generalizing as as symbolic behavior and symbolic information. Um, knowledge as a subset of of that is could be looked at, and it's it's certainly different than belief. It's certainly different than um, feeling, you know? So I think I think it's a, a meaningful difference. I wonder what you think about what knowledge um, might mean. Uh, I think we have a uh, tradition on uh, epistemic agency and build, building knowledge of each other ideas and theories. And so uh, this is very cultural dependence. 
but uh, it's very sophisticated. So it, it can be really a body of knowledge from, for a profession. But when you are inside that culture of one profession, for instance, you have the habits, the way of thinking. And so it's, it's connected to, to the way people behave in, in, inside that, that culture. Therefore, I think it's very uh, uh, an interesting uh, concept. And then from, from this tradition, you have not only induction, deduction, but also abduction. Then you, you understand how to, to, to build knowledge, how to create knowledge. So I think it's very much related to the experimentation that uh, you need in the, the world. But I, I was trying to, to make the relations. Just well, I think, I think maybe you just gave me a thought, which is that perhaps it's, it's um, there's... Um, like a a self awareness about it basically it's it's like it's a bit more like a meta cognition right like we we know what we know like and we and knowing that is and knowing that other people know things like knowledge is is uh that information that is um conventional enough that we almost can like build from that it's it's uh, take it for granted and then go from there um and that's different than all of the things that we we're not even aware of or that are hard to even communicate or experience outside of certain moments. So maybe knowledge has that kind of um, self-aware quality that distinguishes it from other kinds of symbolic thought. Good question. Thank you. Hmm. Thank you. Okay, so uh, Hank. Hi. Uh, I just want to thank you, I'll put it my way, for organizing this kind of, uh, I'm going to call it foundational material. Okay. Um, I'm, my work is as a psychotherapist. I've been around for a while and, you know, people have tried to organize this material, not in this uh, evolutionary biology way. And I, I haven't heard enough of this, uh, you know, sort of genes and memes. And this is a, a really great uh, a structure. Okay, so I'm imagining myself as a researcher, which I'm not, and that you're developing a model. And I'm wondering if you're thinking of it this way, uh, what is your hypothesis of how you're using this model and what do you want to discover or measure? I don't know if that's a fair question, but that's my way of formulating and sharing my curiosity. I, I ask it to others. Uh, and David, you too. I know you're going to be talking about it next time, also. But okay, that's that's mm -hmm. my comment. Yeah, I'll say I'll say the first thing that comes to mind, which also really has driven my um, interest in in exploring the symbotype, is okay. We're studying culture. We're studying what's being um, transmitted and created by a collective of people. And there's all this information. It produces these traits. People know how to do things. They have these techniques and tools. And um, part of it is is how they describe it, how they understand it, the symbolic framework with which all of this has gains meaning. Um, and part of like the symbotype as an informational set make is a lot easier to think about and and kind of it almost begs the question is is what do we do with all of the writing and recordings of dead minds if we gathered all that up like i kind of gave that experiment would that not be their symbotype at least in some sort of general sense i mean it's let's say we had a record of everything you've ever said <laughs> i mean this is like your verbal expression um in total and is so is that your symbol type? Like, what is that? Is that is that just some record and it, it's devoid of any uh, meaning? But no, of course not. We can study culture over time and how these ideas sort of came and then they were shared and and that there's like um, something about how we can do that through not behavior, but through the products of behavior, the writing and things like that, the externalization of our thinking. Um, into some fixed form that just for me at least begs the question of like is that is that the symbol type is that is that different than how what's in our minds um or is it enough that we could actually retell a cultural history of people 
through that alone. And obviously we do, <laughs> we take it for granted that that's enough. So it's um, really the question is whether it's the same, not just whether it's useful. And well, that's what I'm trying to figure out. Yeah. Well, Sage, what I, I was thinking of an example of some reason my mind is going to Nietzsche. Okay. We know something about him, what he said. I don't know what his symbol type yet is because I don't know him well enough. And uh, <laughs> But I guess to apply what you're saying, I'm going to say, well, well, like me, nobody knows me. I'm a little guy, a little, not a little guy, but, you know, I don't have much influence on the world. I speak to some people. Uh, you guys are pro-social, have a lot greater influence. But even now, Sage, how is this discussion and your presentation and what's going to come out of it, how is it going to affect the bigger culture? And then over 100 years, over three minutes, and then what's going to be the feedback? And how is that going to, sorry about that noise. Ah, and how is that going to sort of, in that feedback loop, can you hear me? Yeah. Shit. Oh, mm -hmm. I lost it. Yeah. And that feedback loop, how is it going to change my, I'm going to call it that, uh, that symbol type that uh, we use the language of subjectivity that nobody else can know, but we can only approximate and inf infer. So along those lines, I think of what you're talking about as something as a model that can begin to help us kind of take a look at this, these amazing feedback loops. Yeah, yeah. I mean, okay. I, think it's, it's, I think that's it, right? It's, it's the best we can do is, is to ask people what they're thinking if we want to know what they're thinking. Um, they can't just give it to us. It has to be communicated. Um, and so I think the symbol type just represents that in aggregate over a person's lifetime or over uh -huh. an hour, uh, over a population. Um, but yeah, it's it's as incomplete as your one's ability to communicate it. And so the sort of like real version of it that's in your mind that really reflects like everything, all the ways that you might think is still unknowable. But there is, I think from a research perspective, the possibility today more than ever with all of the data that we have that we could reach a certain level of just sheer volume to get a pretty good idea of what people might um what, what they might have in their heads basically well um, is what you're saying and i'll just stop with that is if is a, a more sophisticated way of trying to define fi knowing what somebody's voice is in the bigger picture, whether it's in a small group or whether they communicate, but it, it's some way of thinking about this this thumbprint, uh, yeah. this, this exquisite thumbprint and trying to find out what that looks like over uh, uh, a long range, a long time, you know, like a longitudinal study of what's your voice now, what's it been up till now, what's it gonna be in the future? Or David's voice yeah. is much more, out there in the public domain. So I, that's how I'm in, in, yeah. inferring it now. I think it's, I'll just reiterate the point that Paul brought in, especially in his his absence, that um, there is no symbotype. There's no symbolic information without behavior. It's an it's an expression. That's how I put it as well. I mean, the symbotype, we could call the, the cumulative product of that and package it up and say, here's your mm -hmm. symbotype and all the information. But does that tell you how you're going to act in a different context? What about a context you've never been in? What about after three days of a context you've never been in? You're in the wilderness somewhere with a couple of people and your symbol type has probably changed dramatically. So I know, I, I think there's the, the, the recombinatorial po possibility mm -hmm. is will never allow us to just sort of simulate our minds. We can just download our minds, but in that, our symbotype, if we just gathered up everything we could, always is a reflection of behavior in context. It was some sort of expression at one point. You know, keeping that in mind that it does, it, there is there is a context, then I think we can approach it through kind of behavioral analytical means um, with the huge caveat that we don't know what hasn't happened. So, I mean, it's, it's, it, it, it's uh it's a blunt instrument for sure. Thanks. Yeah, so gosh, it's so interesting listening to you, Sage, and we're supposed to be doing this together. 
and uh, and it just shows you how nascent these ideas are in the first place. So I mean, so uh, I mean, they're really. I mean, it's it's we're making it up basically. Um, um, there's very it's such a new concept and so important, uh, but it's very very in its preliminary early days of of formulating uh, formulating this, which makes it very exciting. But I find it. Um, as I was listening to you, I was I had this thought that this just doesn't seem very tractable to me. It, it, it just I, it, I find it, it would be really hard to study it empirically, and it made me wonder if if maybe it's not being made too complicated, and and there's a simpler way to 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 proceed. And and as an illustration of that, I think I invite us to look at the matrix, the good old act matrix. And what's on top in the mind? What's on the bottom in the world? Action, mind, inside, outside. Symbotype, phenotype. And so I think that that uh, if we think of that, how we act, how we act depends on how we think. We are talking about the symbotype phenotype relationship right then and there. And to bring in the concept of stories, I think as to what's being selected, I would say that the story is the symbotype and then the behaviors that are motivated by the story is the phenotype. What's wrong with that? Um, uh, now you can measure the story too, but that's also true in genetics. So they call that the endophenotype. So, so we make an inside outside distinction for the genotype and the phenotype, even though we can go inside and measure it up, up and down. Uh, mm -hmm. But I, I, it seems very useful in in um, both in biology to, to make that inside outside distinction and in therapy with the ACT matrix uh, to think there's something about, you know, this processing that the, what's going on in your mind and how it causes you to, to, uh, to behave. And then uh, let me give you a preview of just one of the studies I've done with uh, a, a former grad student named Yasha Hartford, where we treated they could text like the Bible as an epigenetic symbotype. So the Bible is a big collection of stories. It's uh, transmitted with very high fidelity. So that's cool. It even has a linear structure, kind of like genes on chromosomes, and that's cool. And then when you look to see when on any Sunday and you look at the the sermon and there's all these invocations, what what what's the pastor's doing a current situation, the sermon has to be relevant to the lives of the congregation. He's, he's reaching into the sacred text and he's pulling out the passages that are most apropos and interpreting them. And so that's like epigenetic gene expression. And so we have a whole paper on sacred Texas cultural genome. So there we have it. And look, the sacred text is the symbotype. And then there's an expression process, and then you end up behaving a certain way. So I feel that uh, that might not capture everything, and it's not against what 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 you portrayed, say, not against it at all. But uh, I'm I'm really hoping that we can get something which is like um, very useful and 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 simple to use. That when we study people, either in a therapeutic setting or historically, we really can get at the at the symbotype and the symbol and the phenotype and the relationship between them, that this that this could be tractable, uh, and so uh, um, uh, interesting uh, to get anybody's response to that. And 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 Sage, you might think that what you said was tractable. So so mm -hmm. please feel free to come back at me in any way that you that you like. Yeah, well, I the one just basic critique of that is that um for me is that um thinking um is behavior and um so we don't want to just call the symbotype um what we think um uh or rather internal and external that distinction so what we do outside is is behavior as much as thinking and likewise symbolic thought that's purely internal versus sort of symbolic speech, something public, um, both of which 
only have meaning in any meaningful sense, have meaning um, in context. So like what something means is, is part of the story, uh, the information you need is the context. And so for me, um, I see both of those as symbolic behavior and, and really they are, I mean, thought and speech, um, one's internal, one's external, but the um, external one is no less symbolic, um, especially when it comes to uh, cultural transmission. Um, the external is the one that people can interpret. And so what they think you mean um, needs to be put out there. Um, I do think that we can, I do think the internal external is, is key, absolutely. I just think that um, we don't want to, um, we don't want to draw a distinction between what we think and what we do, um, like, you know, what someone wrote and what they say and what they do, because what they think is also them doing. Um, and, you know, that it's, so for me, I just think of, of I, I pull it back a little bit more um, in more of like an informational definition. And that's mm -hmm. my focus on um, symbolic relations and and what what is something means to be symbolic and how some, what some where something gets meaning um, can come more broadly and then the internal external is really the part of the process and we need to distinguish that absolutely and then there's a difference between something that is expressed as a behavior one time my speech right now as you're hearing it in this moment versus the recording of my speech that someone else is hearing in a different moment um, those those two things are have similar symbolic information. If actually they have the exact same symbolic information, my speech is the same in both cases, but what they mean is different, especially if you um, never met any of us. I know a lot of you folks, so <laughs> it's different for me. Um, and that's the context piece. So that's where the meaning, and so, I, but that's a diff, there's a difference between meaning and information basically. And that's, that's where it comes through. But, you know, we're circling around it, I think for sure. Yeah, no. Uh, uh, who is next? Lano and then Kate. Um, so a couple of things. I wanted to first of all respond to what Paul said um, about uh, behavior being selected um, at the individual level. So I, I think it's important to make a distinction between uh, between the uh, 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 evolution that's going on inside the individual and evolution that's going on at the scale of the society um, or the, the culture. Um, because, uh, you know, for example, we have, we have cells that are specialized, you know, for different particular organ systems like the cardiovascular system or something like that. Um, uh, you know, so, they're, um, so they, they, have, they, they have some particular story uh, and encoded in their genes about what they're supposed to do and how they're supposed to behave, um, and that may, that and and that 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 can evolve at the at the level of you know pro, what, what proteins are, are coded for, etc. Um, but then there's how they interact with everything else, how they interact with each other, and uh, how they in, how how that entire system interacts with the other systems of the body. Um, and I think that we need to we, we need to think of ourselves in in terms of being individuals, but also being part of a collective, um, because of, um, actually actually the you know the culture is very important. We 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 are an obligate cultural species. We can we we cannot survive outside of uh, outside of a culture. Um, uh, so. Uh, um, so I think I, I think it's important to make the distinction between. Uh, a behavioral evolution of the individual and evolution of the cultural system of behavior that drives certain processes, because those things, those are those are two different scales, and they have and and they have different effects, and they're conserved different differently. Um, so when I'm talking when I'm talking about a story, I'm talking more like what David was just talking about regarding like the Bible, whereas you can you, where you can see the Bible as a story or a collection of stories. Um, uh, that are, you know, uh, being like you, like you, like David was saying, being read out and driving and, and driving behavior, like you might read off, you know, uh, which proteins to, to, to produce out of the, uh, out of, out of, out of the DNA. Um, uh, uh, so, um, 
and and that 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 nexus of stories uh, is conserved over a long period of time, drives particular behaviors, um, and uh, has has a clear evolutionary history. I mean, we can document the evolutionary history of those particular stories. Um, so it, clearly, stories are evolving, and stories are driving our behavior, and individual behavior does evolve individually in, in, uh, in context of the culture that, that constrains our individual behavior, constrains how, how that individual behavior can evolve or is likely to evolve within a particular you know, range. Um, but but those individual, that individual behavior interacts with all of the other individual behavior and together we get a behavior that is, that, that, that is collective uh, that may not be, you, you couldn't necessarily look at the individual piece and know what you were going to get, just like cellular automata, um, uh, but, you know, at a, but, but at a more complicated level. So I think that, I think that those, those two, two levels of evolution that, that are going on, I think are important to distinguish. Secondly, um, I, can't, I think it was Caesar, I can't remember, um, who asked about knowledge. And I, I, I mean, I have a I'm not sure if this will help, but the, this is my definition of knowledge. Um, uh, so I say that uh, 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 you get data, you get sensory data, and sensory data is organized by, uh, by low-level processes in the, uh, of the brain into information. Uh, you know, for example, I can look at, I, I, I get a bunch of photons off of the wall and my brain organizes it into what the wall looks like, okay? Uh, but then you get information that's organized by a worldview into knowledge. So whenever we, whenever we have knowledge, what, we're, what, what, what that means is that we're taking, in, we're taking in information from the world and organizing it according to some kind of ontology. Um, and, uh, uh, and that ontology is the, is, 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 is the, uh, is the, uh, is the genetic signature of the stories that we the uh, of, of the stories that uh, that we have internalized effectively? Um, so I, th I think that's that's you know that 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 gets us you know all the way through that through that that system. Um, uh, yeah, so I think that's I think that's what I got right now. Okay, Great. Uh, Caesar, Great. Uh, the only thing I'll say is is we need to uh, move out of the auditory into the visual realm because we're talking about cyclic dynamic interactions and uh i uh need to draw to uh we all do really i mean once you get past a num number of bi-directional relationships it just starts sounding like <laughs> but i know I was, I was following you and i but i think there's that would love to um basically see a diagram of it just to really uh compare to ones that i was working with Sure. Feel, free, feel free to share if you do. I will. I will. Uh, I will put something together on that. Um, uh, uh, Kate. All right. Thank you so much, Sage. Um, uh, as a as a history geek, or maybe just another type of research geek, um, I, I'm really grateful that uh, I was able to follow everything you said. Not being a scientist. Um, so geeks unite of all different Good. research categories. Um, I, I may or may not have a question based on sort of a preliminary question um, that if you can answer, that'll that'll that might that might suffice. But it's it's my question. My preliminary question is is what is the impact of individual experience on symbotype? Does that, I mean, we're looking at cultural influences on a, on a larger scale, but, but what about the, the individual experience? And if, if that's, if that's relevant, I have, I have a little further to go with it, but yeah, am I, am I, am I going off on a tangent? That's not. No. Not well, and it's, if, if you, if you're unclear, it's only because I've been unclear. The symbotype is a term to capture the individual, the individual, um, symbolic uh potential like the search space what what one of us might think versus what another might think and we could call those differences each other symbotypes and the experience is right on it because we only get um any of that informational potential because we have symbolic behavior so it's always in context it's always experienced embodied 
Um, it's a psychological process. It's a behavior. So anything that we could call symbotype has always stemmed from all past behaviors before, symbolic behaviors before. Thank you. Well, you know, coming at this from the angle of pro-social spirituality, where we're trying to have, you know, the broadest of umbrellas, you know, no, no specifics at all in terms of, you know, dogma, anti-dogma, any of that. It, that's, that's not the point, but to recognize the importance of um, each person's valid experience. Um, you know, I, I found myself thinking as some others were sharing of my time I spent in my 20s out at sea, um, offshore for weeks at a time where I developed a capacity to see things differently by virtue of, of spending that time away. I also had, I also sailed with people who had, uh, who had been at sea for 25 years, you know, Coast Guard um, captains and whatnot that had had a very different set of eyes than um, the average person. And so because of that, in my 20s, I, I recognized, um, you know, I mean, that different people see different things. For example, I personally have never laid eyes on a UFO. Even in my years off at, at sea, no spaceships descended, no, you know, aliens uh, boarded our, our boat or anything like that. But I did see things that I've never seen before or since because of my individual experience of, you know, the sensory experience of being offshore, the, the electromagnetic experience of being off the continental shelf um, changed, changed a lot to the extent that makes me feel like, okay, I've never seen UFO, but maybe somebody else has, and that's okay with me, even though it doesn't fit in with sort of this broader understanding of, um, you know, a collective agreement. Um, yeah. Does this, does this, is this relevant for, for this type of conversation? I think that's exactly it. And it's also why um, I made the note of like in practice, you know, all, yes, we could, you know, long after one is, is gone, you know, take all of those experiences, all the notes and things you've said, and and you know, here's a story of you in in this, and call that your symbotype. But it's 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 over time. The symbotype has to be expressed to be understood, and symbolic behavior is contextual. So I think in that moment, your whole set, and just to maybe switch to contextual behavioral science, you know, the set of relational frames, the things that were pertinent to you that were relevant, you know, the content of your environment was, was the context was changing what things meant. So things that wouldn't have meant things uh, suddenly did in a different context. And so mm -hmm. I think that's exactly it. And that's it for me is the critical piece of thinking of um, this as behavior is we remind ourselves that the meaning comes through the context and that this is at the heart of what an adaptive fiction is, which is like, we have these set of beliefs. They may have no correspondence to sort of like ontological truth, but they cohere in a way that allows us to understand the world, to operate in the world. And, you know, outside of the goal for ontological truth, um, that's immensely important. And I think if we dis if we just disregard things that aren't just sort of like empirically valid, we'll lose sight of like, what are the stories, back to stories that people tell themselves to understand different contexts they're in. I mean, let's say people are in like an abusive relationship or in a, you know, a, like a extremely hostile environment. Like what are the stories they tell themselves to make sense of that? Are those stories true? No, but the true stories would probably crush them. <laughs> so those stories are true in the sense that like they allow one to exist outside of that environment. So it's not always about like thinking things as the way they are. And I think that the... Yeah, the the way I'd be so curious to know, like, if you could identify, you know, ordinary ordinary things that like suddenly just were different. Um, I'm sure you could. Definitely, yeah. I think what you're describing reminds me of that uh, wonderful film, Life Is Beautiful, where within a concentration camp, the, yes. the father created a different reality uh, yeah. to protect his son. Like that, I get that. Um, yeah. But I think we can also, you know, recognize the individual experience as a way to open our own eyes and ears to what others may share. Um, you know, I know that I know there's a cow because I've seen a cow. Um, but, um, you know, 
I have never, I don't know, I'm trying to think of something I've never seen that I don't know, but I, I'm going to, so anyhow, I appreciate well, this. I think this yeah. helps, this lends um, scientific uh, rigor to the um, validation of, of various worldviews and various ex uh, in experiences. So thanks so much, Sage. Absolutely. And thanks. Yeah. For and I just want to add okay. one to just, just I to connect to the spirituality piece is, is part of what the role of the individual experience brings to bear when you think of it in those terms is the intangible, the inarticulable, the impossibility of communicating a spiritual experience in a way that gives the other person that experience um, or even replicating the conditions for it. Like it could just, it just happens, right? So many of the times. And so I think that, and then even after the fact, we like struggled, we try to like understand it, but uh, we can't, maybe, maybe we can't, maybe we do and we feel enlightened, but you know, often it's like, there. it's a deeper aspect of how we understand things that comes through. And um, it's such an individual experience that even ourselves, we struggle to understand our own, <laughs> what happened. So, you know, just thinking of things in, in larger than individual terms would, you know, that's why I think spirituality has such a hard time, especially in the modern world, outside of like organized religion, where you have these crafted mechanisms and contexts to really get people in the mood. <laughs> um, it's it's hard to transmit. It's almost impossible. And so it just ends up sounding like nothing, really. I mean, it's like, unless you get it already, you don't have any idea what somebody is talking about. Um, what, what I often say, Sage, you know, to quote a very austere uh, traditionalist, a, a Trappist monk who influenced a lot of people, Catholic and all, um, would say, uh, Thomas Keating would say, there are as many religions on planet Earth at any given moment as there are human beings on Earth. And I share that in this context because it breaks down the tribalism. It breaks down the, you know, the, the, um, the package deals and whatnot to just say, to, to fully respect the individual experience and what you're saying about sort of the ineffability of it that you can't really uh, nail it down. So thank you. This is really yeah. helpful to me as I'm navigating uh, both worlds. Great. Yeah, well, I think that one of the things to point out, we're at time or over time. And so, um, and so uh, is how pleasurable this has been. And you would think that in a research seminar, because it does take a deep dive and it does get really deep, uh, geeky, people would just like to lose the thread or they'd but that's not what happened. I mean, we just think we all feel like we've plumbed some depth. Uh, and I think in some ways it's close to a spiritual experience that you're, you know, you're, you're, you're uh, uh, dimly seeing something out there that's very grand um, and we can have that, uh, that experience. And so I'm really happy uh, not only to have had this research seminar, but to have this audience for the research. Uh, seminar and not to make this elitist in any way uh, at all. This conversation was as good as any graduate seminar or university seminar that I've ever um, that I've ever been. And I get to have a whole hour to speak next week. <laughs> <laughs> I can't wait. And so uh, I'm gonna uh, uh, hold my tongue until then, but there's so much to say and uh, I look forward to taking the next step and then week after week, we'll be getting um, ourselves and our colleagues, and we'll plumb these depths, uh, I think. So thank you very much, uh, as always. And uh, we'll see you next week uh, at this seminar series, this Friday, for Joe Carson's talk, our very own Joe Carson. And just about every day, something is going on now at the Pro-Social Commons. And if, you, and if there's something that's not going on and, and, and you'd like to birth it, then then that's what the pro-social commons is all about. So I think, and we're we're getting pretty good at it. So, so uh, thank you, everyone, and uh, I will uh, sign off. Thanks, everybody. Thank you.